So uh, firstly, I would just want to reiterate my thanks. I thought those were two very thought provoking uh, talks and I really enjoyed both of them. And uh, I, I kind of I have a, a question that, that I think comes more from David's talk than Somtochi, but you may, Somtochi may have some thoughts on this too. I, 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 one of the things that I've heard discussed a lot with GitOps is two approaches, a kind of pull versus push approach. And um, I definitely thought that there was a, a strong significance of the law of Demeter to that discussion. So I just wondered, if, you know, David, do you have thoughts about pull versus push in, in uh, GitOps and, and, and what are they? I, yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the pull and push is, you know, an argument that we have in various technology things, right? You know, metrics is one, GitOps is another, and it all boils down to the same thing. It's coupling. Whenever we wish to push something somewhere, both things essentially really need to have knowledge that each other exists. So the pull approach is the one, you know, and this is why Prometheus is so prominently in favor of the pull approach is that you don't need to bake your applications with the knowledge of where to push those metrics, uh, push those metrics to. And instead we flip the knowledge and the responsibility to the other side. So I think that pull based systems um, reduce our coupling and make things generally much more flexible. But it's definitely a trade off depending on your environment for sure. So I'm touchy. Have you got uh, any thoughts on that question? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just, I, I kind of, yeah, I, I do think, I mean, one of the things that I noticed with my experience with Prometheus and, and this is that it did take a mind shift to to shift from that kind of pull approach to, to the push, you know, from push based approach to pull based approach. And I, I do think that some people are going through that. It's also similar in my mind to that kind of mind shift that goes on from very synchronous view of the world to a much more asynchronous view of the world. So uh, I have another question, which is, uh, and by the way, I should remind people, if anyone does have a question for these great speakers, please pop it into the GitOps Days Slack channel, uh, which I am monitoring. And if there's a good question, I will feed it straight to them. Um, so you've both talked about uh, access control uh, and David, you much talked very much about access control in, in Git. And so I'm touching you, you talk very much about access control in Kubernetes. Um, I'm really interested in how those play out and how, how you might think about the whole of those across the, across the divide and, and, and try and get that straight in my head, how those two things interact. Let me go first to some touchy. Have you got some thoughts about how the role-based access control in Kubernetes fits with the, the permissions in Git? Um, yeah, I think um, access control has to do so, has a lot to do with security. And security is every, something that has to be applied at every step of the way. So um, whatever it is, you know, the pipeline, gates, the cluster itself, the application, every single level has to, you know, have some kind of access control based on who needs to access what. And that's that's basically how it ties in. It ties into the, you know, the whole security of, you know, your application and your deployments as a whole. I think that's how it, it ties. Each of them is like, you know, under the rung of, a, a rung in the ladder of um, security. Basically each, each step strengthens the security of, you know, whatever you're deploying it prevents unwanted access from whoever it is. So yeah, I think if you ignore one and just do the other, you know, it's not complete. It could create holes in whatever you're trying to do in the security of your application. So I think taking care of each of them, you know, having it in mind that each of these things are important and taking care of each of them is important. Thank you. Thanks, Tontochi. Very useful. David, over to you. Yeah, so it's definitely um, tricky, right? It's like security authentication is one of those things that I, I'm always going to make the assumption that I'm going to get it wrong. So I've always just applied this blanket rule of zero trust to all of my infrastructure. 
In fact, anyone that's worked on a production system with me over the last kind of 15 years will right away tell you that I am a terrible person because I wouldn't let them SSH onto their hardware. So, and I, I think that that's, if we can, I like to adopt that as a blanket approach first. Like it doesn't mean you can't SSH on, but by default, there's no access. And I generally build fail safe systems through a controller, very much like GitOps, usually salt stack running on the machine that I can send a message to and tell it to enable SSH for one hour. And that only works if you give it a message to see why you need SSH access. And I kind of take a very similar approach to Kubernetes, especially because GitOps is an enabler here. And that if we identify the reasons that someone may need access to a Kubernetes cluster, they're either because A, my monitoring and logging is not centralized and they don't have access to get logs from pods. They don't have access to debug problems in production. So we need to make sure we are along this journey that we have all that information leaving our cluster. The second reason they may need access to the Kubernetes cluster is they want to make changes. Well, why do they want to make changes? And why is that not going through our GitOps reconciliation? Like why? And again, there are reasons, but I think by default, I generally prefer to say there's no access and then have something available to permit access. And that just may be a special branch in your GitOps repository that applies uh, an RBAC rule that gives people ability to enter that cluster for one hour and then disappears. Like, I'm not sure how that works yet specifically, but I. I would say just not give people access and try and work out why they need it and get that stuff out of the machine or into the machine through other channels. So kind of opinionated approach to security. <laughs> uh, I like that approach a lot. I think that's really interesting. I, I guess, I guess one of the things that I'm that that kind of uh, and you both made this this point of kind of. You know, you have to apply maximal security everywhere and, and zero trust, which I, I think is absolutely key. Uh, I guess I'm still want to dig in a little further. So, uh, if I'm if I'm building a permissions model, am I am I building that fundamentally in Git first, and then the Kubernetes is permissions are, are really subsidiary to that. Uh, and that's really, I guess, what you were kind of implying, David, by talking about saying, well, directory structures don't work, branches do. Um, or, or am I sort of using both of them equally to, to enforce my, my permissions, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at here. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, when we are using GitOps and say we are adopting a zero trust policy by default and that the developers don't have access to kube control apply anything then their only model of modifying that cluster is through git and, you know and we have the ability through github and GitLab to have teams and organizations and branch permissions and no those are our defaults those are where we secure first and then i think you know when we have identified use cases or break glass scenarios that people do need access to the kubernetes cluster is when we start to lay in the rbac models and other security policies there but I definitely think we start with Git, we trust the automation, and then we provide edge cases rather than you know going the other way by default. Very cool. Somtachi, did you have anything else that this discussion is? Yeah, I think um, it's security is something that um, people don't think can be applied declaratively, like storing you know all those policies and stuff in the cluster, um, but it can. And that's also why it ties into who has permissions to do what on your Git repository. So it all connects, right? So um, whoever can, you know, has access to your, your Git repository can probably create the RBAC to do something else on your cluster. And, you know, the controller would apply it and stuff like that. So yeah, I think um, everything just connects that way that you can definitely manage security declaratively. It's it's something that is a bit coming up and I think it's difficult, but it can be done. But then it also satisfies the idea that your Git repository has to also be secure. Because whoever has access can make those changes, security wise, security or otherwise. Very cool. I guess one of the really interesting aspects here is the sort of audit and visibility you know i think one of the things that that your your work on touchy shows is that you know if you have a you know if you, if you have the permissions and and configuration stored in yaml there's a there's a kind of an analyzable aspect of that um I, 
the the Git uh, branch and and repository access is obviously really cool and useful. I, I guess you do get the audit log from the from the pull requests, but I, I'm not. Yeah, you know, I guess there's some dependence then on whether you're using GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, or what particular system you're using to manage the permissions of of access to the repo. Sorry, I didn't and get the last. I, I'm Sorry. just, I'm just, I'm, I'm just uh, freestyling, guys. That wasn't really a question. Sorry, uh, I just was thinking aloud there. Apologies. So, so I do have a question from Slack, um, and it's quite a long question. So you'll have to give me a moment to read it out. It comes from Error Developer, aka Ilya. And it, by the way, if anyone else has questions who's listening, please type them in. It says. And, and this is to you, David. Oh, With yeah. regards to config as code in GitOps, I'd imagine using JavaScript, Python, or another general purpose language of the reach ecosystem would provide answers to most concerns you'd raised. I'd say that GitOps config repos might still contain flat YAML data, but the operator's developer would interact with a high level code that generates the configs and repo branch directories as an implementation detail. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I mean yeah definitely agree i think um you know we have this yaml approach and we're doing the best we can right now i think we're all suffering from you know very much yaml fatigue for, to a certain degree um and then trying to manipulate augment and, and work with the yaml in a way we're, we're already noticing the boundaries of where we can actually get with that and there is a whole wealth of tooling that is starting to come out of the ecosystem and the communities now that are trying to provide alternative template and approaches that do favor composability and extension um, with better models. You know, uh, <laughs> Helm 3, I was hoping, you know, we we're going to get the Lua scripting. It never really came to fruition. And we're, you know, we're still working with Go templates within YAML. But there are other tools like Capitan, there's Pulumi, there is uh, YTT in the Carvel project. So in fact, even, you know, JSON or JSONet, depending on how you want to pronounce that, there are these alternatives that are giving us a little bit more of a dynamic programmable way of declaring our infrastructure, our applications. Um, and I'm a big advocate for Pulumi. Um, you know, I think I speak enough on Twitter about how I'm using Pulumi to generate, there's a really cool project coming out of the Pulumi team actually called CRD to Pulumi, where you pass it the CRD definitions from your cluster and it generates static types and TypeScript and Go and Python that allows you to interact, describe and work with those types in a really great fashion that gives you validation and assertions before you push that code up to your Git repository. Um, of course, when you go that approach, you have to rely on not using any GitOps tools yet in the cluster because they don't know how to compile those assets down to the YAML-based manifest. So we still got a little bit of a gap that using some of those tools relies on a push-based model. But I'm hoping the tooling is going to come around to support GitOps working with those tools as well over time. Have you, have you looked at uh, CDK 8S? at all i have not played with the cdk no the... okay so that also does have a some ability to import crds um it's not it was a while i looked last looked at it maybe three or four months ago and it wasn't perfect but it was a really good start and that generates the yamls that then can you can then reason with and manage in a pull based environment. So uh, that might be another project that might be interesting from that point of view. Yeah, definitely. I, I think there's going to be a lot of evolution over the next, hopefully, hopefully over the next 12 months in this space. I know the Pulumi team are working on operators that will run in the cluster that can, you know, continually process and uh, apply Pulumi code. There, you know, the CDK stuff is obviously exciting. I think we're realizing now that we need to start embracing our, our infrastructure as code in code and not just a DSL that covers a small subset of what we actually need to declaratively define our applications and environments. I, I do, I, I did think that maybe Ilya was, error developer with his question was slightly questioning, maybe you didn't get this, but I think his, his view was that the whether it's a repo, a branch, or a directory is is not doesn't matter because 
you have a build process that creates the right structure and, and creates and so it's the build process that's repeatable um which i'm not sure you completely agree with so you kind of said yes but i don't really <laughs> believe you meant yes okay no um <laughs> so yeah uh, so if uh, Maybe I'll read it, read, it, read the question again later, and I'll I'll come back to them. But my thoughts on that, based on what you've kind of uh, followed up with, if we're relying on these languages to produce YAML that produces an application for an environment, that's really good. We still need a branch based or a directory based model for each individual environment too. From a well, from a point of view that we still want to be able to promote and work with the the, the YAML that is produced across environments for example if we add a new deployment we want to be able to do that in a staging branch and then test it and then when we're happy with that we promote that through to production but we still want that declarative definition yaml to be the same regardless of the environment and we want to use the environment and infer the, the different properties from the environment itself rather than having the coupling from the application side that's trying to be aware of the environment and going oh i'm in production i'm going to scale faster well, the environment should provide these semantics and we declare them in the environment provisioning step. Um, so, you know, the environments are the snowflakes. The applications should be ubiquitous across them. That kind of the goal that I'm trying to enable. Very cool. Right. We've just got time for one last little question. And um, uh, it's I just I'm just really interested. You know, we get these we get such great expertise on. Is there anything you think is coming next? that um that you're really in, interested in the future of GitOps or some project that's upcoming that you'd really like to give a shout out to or something that that is exciting you so i'll start with you david since you've got your mic on and then i'll come to some touchy <laughs> uh yeah you know i mentioned the capitan project i really love their approach to composability to declare our manifest uh, i'm keeping a very keen eye on that uh, and, you know, and I've been a very early adopter of the GitOps toolkit. So, you know, I also want to just give a shout out to Stefan and say great work. You know, I'm really enjoying kicking the tires on that and excited to see what, what comes to the line. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Some touchy. Yeah, um, <laughs> David took it out of my mouth. Um, that maybe the GitOps toolkit, I think it's exciting. Um, I think it lays the groundwork for some other work on top of this, you know, by separating into you know various controllers i think it lays ground for other people who might have different use cases than who what the builders thought about to so take all those pieces and you know create something else yeah i think that's also what i'm excited about there's also this cloud cluster api provider nested sort of like um sort of a cube builder declarative pattern way of building Operators, um, I think you can, uh, people should check it out. It's fairly new, but I think it introduces some interesting ideas. Brilliant. Thank you both. That was a really interesting conversation. And once again, you know, fantastic sessions. And uh, thank you so much for all your help and effort on this.